<clears throat> excuse me. Well, I think you can see that the Bible can have an effect on you, of course. And as we're looking through the book of Acts, as we're looking at apologetics, and, and particularly as we're looking at the book of Acts, we're challenged here, again, to take seriously what the Lord has called us to do. And He, he hasn't called us simply to live our own lives for our own pleasure and just kind of do what we want to do. He, he's called us to give ourselves to Him fully to serve Him in everything that we do. And there, there's a big difference between those two things. So we need to be thinking about how we are involved in what the Lord has called us to do and whether we're involved in it with, with our whole heart. So let's, um, let, let's think about that. So first, by way of review, uh, we saw last week, um, well, actually over the past couple of weeks, Peter and John go up to the temple to pray where the Lord healed the lame man and Peter, again, the one who previously had been hiding from those that were seeking to harm him, the Jews that were looking for the disciples, uh, now boldly proclaims, he preaches to this crowd that gathers around this healed lame man and 5,000 people are converted. Quite a change. Peter and John were subsequently arrested and put on trial by the leaders of Israel. And when they were asked by whose authority they had done this, instead of sheepishly sort of uh, retreating and trying to kind of hide Jesus in the closet, they didn't hesitate to answer, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Again, great boldness. And when the council commanded them no longer to speak or teach in His name, they boldly answered that they would not stop, they could not stop, because the Lord had told them to tell as many people as they could what they had seen and heard, and they were going to obey God rather than men. And that in the face again of the Sanhedrin, who had the authority to put them to death. Now, after the council had threatened them further, they were released. They went back to their companions. They told them everything that had happened. And instead of all of them running for the hills, they immediately sought the Lord in prayer for more of His power, more of His Spirit, and they were again filled with His Spirit and began to proclaim the gospel boldly. Now, you know, sometimes, sometimes we think that this phenomenon, you know, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, actually that is true in a certain sense, this filling of the Holy Spirit, this revival was only something that was confined to biblical times or to certain points in history. But we do need to realize there's a difference between revival where the Lord pours the Spirit out on, on a huge, you know, um, section, cross-section of society and that filling of the Spirit that each of us can have every day if we will simply seek the Lord. We can be revived like this. We can have this kind of zeal. This is not unusual. This is not just for biblical times. This is not just for particular people. And we see that because of really the four things that we notice from this passage. Uh, first of all, that the disciples noticed that they were filled on the day of Pentecost and that boldness seemed to continue for a while, but then they prayed again and they were filled again. This is something that we should not only experience in, in our lives as Christians since we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. You know, if it's a command, then obviously it's something the Lord intends that, that, that you know, we would participate in, that we would submit to, that we would be filled with. But it's something that we can experience over and over again. We shouldn't content ourselves with just one filling, as it were, but we should always seek to be filled. Secondly, when they were filled with the Spirit of God, notice what they did. They began to proclaim the gospel boldly. They evangelized. If we want to find the power to evangelize, then we must obey this commandment to be filled with the Spirit. And obviously, we need to be filled with the Spirit if we are to be able to obey our Lord's commission to us. Okay. Thirdly, notice that they didn't speak the Word of God sheepishly, but they spoke it boldly. The Spirit of God gives to us what we need the most in order to do what He calls us to do. He gives us courage. He gives us boldness. He gives us the love that will help us to overcome our fears so that we can do what He calls us to do. But then fourthly, the Spirit will only fill us, and this is, again, a very important point, 
that we'll see again and again. He will only fill us if we really want to do what He calls us to do. He won't empower us merely so that we may feel empowered. You know, a lot of Christians today that think they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they believe they're filled with the Spirit because they feel good. And they feel joyful and they can sing and they can go about their daily business doing what they're doing, just feeling good about it. But that's not what the Spirit of God does. He does give us joy, but He gives us joy in the midst of difficulties, the difficulties that we face when we're actually doing what He calls us to do. So we must want to obey if we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that's what we've seen. This morning we see the Spirit brought other blessings to the disciples as well. And that's what the first part of this is really about. He brought a spirit of brotherhood. He, bought, he brought a spirit of generosity. And we see that contrasting the um, covetousness of Ananias and, and Sapphira. Now Luke tells us the congregation was of one heart and soul which means that they were experiencing the love that Jesus said that those who belonged to him would experience. They were loving their neighbors themselves, their brother and sister. They saw them in need. Remember what James says, if you see your brother and sister in need and you say, be warm and be filled, but you don't do anything to meet that need, how does the love of Christ dwell in you? Well, these people were not just saying to one another, I, I hope the Lord takes care of you, but they were selling their resources and freely sharing what they had to help those who were in, in need. So as the apostles continued to preach the gospel and as the Lord continued to bring people into the church, those who owned lands and houses sold them and brought the money to the apostles that it might be used to meet their needs. By the way, I should mention this is the first Sunday of the month. <laughs> and this is when we normally would take up a diaconal offering, which we, we haven't been taking up offerings because of the COVID situation hand-to-hand -hand. I don't want to touch things that other people have touched. But if you would like to contribute to that, um, please put it in the basket uh, in the back. So, but this is what they were doing, taking care of one another's needs. They were continuing to support those who were converted at the Feast of Pentecost and who had stayed in order to be discipled, but they were also ministering to the poor among them. Now, those who belong to the body of Christ see fellow believers, not just as people who also believe in Jesus, but they see them as family, right? As brothers and sisters in the Lord. And family takes care of, of its own. Uh, this is the kind of heart that the Spirit of God gives to us. We, we are not untouched or unmoved by the needs of those around us, but we become the Good Samaritan to those who are in need and not just to our enemies, which is more difficult to do than to our brethren, but particularly to our brethren. Now, Luke next points out a certain Levite by the name of Joseph, known to us by his more familiar name of Barnabas, who also sold attractive land and brought the money to the apostles. But then he draws our attention to a married couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who also sold a piece of property, but held back part of the proceeds. Now, one thing we should ask here is why does Luke include this? Is it just being a thorough historian? He wants to make sure that he covers everything that takes place? Well, certainly he wants to do that. But it's also because the Spirit of God wanted this account in this text, in, in the Scriptures, uh, to help us. Now, Luke certainly wanted to show Theophilus, remember the uh, the lover of, uh, of God, who was probably the patron who uh, provided the money to publish this gospel. He wanted to show Theophilus as well as his future readers and those that would you know, be able to read a copy of, of the gospel of Luke and those of us who would read it in the future, that though the Lord was blessing uh, the church in many ways, bringing many people into the church, that not all of these people were converted. I mean, we're not true believers, I should say. You know, 3,000 converted on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 subsequent, the Lord continuing to add daily as many as were being saved, and so we have thousands in the church by this time. These people were converted, which means they, they had turned around and they stopped doing, you know, what, what they shouldn't be doing. They began going to church and fellowshipping with everyone else. But that doesn't mean 
but they were all saved. I mean, think about the author to the Hebrews writing to that group of Jewish believers who were being tempted to leave the church because of the persecution of the Romans against the church, and they were going back to Judaism. The author to the Hebrews says, if you do that, then there's no hope that you're ever going to repent and come back to Jesus. And he was talking to a group of professing believers. Now, that doesn't mean that believers can lose their salvation. We know that they cannot. What it means is there are people in the church who really do not know the Lord. Being a part of the visible church is not the same as being born again. They do not overlap entirely. So what Luke is warning Theophilus of and what the Lord is warning us of is to make sure that we don't have the same kind of heart that Ananias and Sapphira had, which is a divided heart, which is what the Laodiceans had, okay? Okay, so let's first of all consider this case of Ananias and Sapphira. We just noted how many of the disciples were selling their possessions to meet the needs of the new disciples and how Barnabas had also sold some land to donate to this cause. It's possible that Luke is singling you know, Barnabas out here because of the influence he was having on other people. Again, notice his given name was Joseph, but the apostles were calling him Barnabas. They gave him another name. And that name means son of encouragement. And that's because Barnabas was an encouragement. He was a blessing to those around him. Uh, he was given this gift by the Lord, and he was using this gift to help other believers. Now, I think we, we all know from our own experience that we need to be encouraged from time to time to keep moving ahead in the things of the Lord. Believe it or not, that's what this is. This is encouragement to move ahead in the things of the Lord, because it's so easy to fall into that way of thinking that many Christians have today. I, I'm saved by what Jesus has done. I don't have to add to it. It's all complete. So what difference does it make what I do, whether I obey and serve Him or not? Well, we're going to see in a few moments through what happens to Ananias and Sapphira that it does matter what we do. It, it makes all the difference in the world. If we belong to the Lord, we will press on in the things of the Lord. But to do this, we do need each other's encouragement. By the way, that's the reason why the author to the Hebrews told his audience that they were not to neglect the gathering of themselves together on the Lord's day to worship the Lord. And the reason being is because not only does it show you that you love Him, the fact that you know, your heart has brought you out to worship because this, what we're doing here is commanded by Him. What we're doing here is to give Him honor and glory. And when there's a, peop a group of people getting together to honor your Lord whom you say you love the most and you're not willing to come and participate in that, well, that says something about your heart. So the author to the Hebrews is saying, don't neglect that. But he also said not to neglect it because this is where the encouragement takes place when we actually gather together, perhaps a little bit more freely when we're not masked and, you know, this COVID situation isn't here. But you know how it was in the past. We, after the service, we would spend another hour, two hours together fellowshipping and sharing a meal together and hopefully trying to encourage one another to follow and serve the Lord. We are not to forsake this assembly because God commands it, because it shows love to Him, and because we need this encouragement. Now, Barnabas' sacrifice, his example, he sold, he gave. And the honor that was bestowed upon him by this name given to him by the apostles appears to have encouraged other people to want to imitate him. Uh, in particular, this seems to be the case with Ananias and Sapphira. You know, good examples are another form of encouragement, aren't they? It's much easier to do the right thing, to do what the Lord calls us to do when you see other people doing it as well. If we don't see anybody else doing it, you know, we're tempted to think that we shouldn't bother with it either. I mean, haven't you found that to be the case? When you see somebody who's doing what the Lord calls you to do, hey, that, that's why we read Christian biographies. That's why we like Spurgeon, why we like Jonathan Edwards, you know, George Whitfield is because they're doing it. Doesn't that 
encourage you. But if you don't see anybody doing it, doesn't that discourage you? Well, it does. And we can all use encouragement. But the Lord also tells us that we are to be Barnabases to one another. You know, that even if we don't see anybody else being that encouragement, that we are still responsible to do what the Lord calls us to do and to encourage others even if nobody else is. That one example that stands out in church history of Athanasius. Remember Athanasius who stood firmly on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. How important is that? If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you can't be saved. That's what the Bible says. You're believing in a false Christ. What was it that was written on Athanasius' tombstone? Athanasius against the world. Basically, here's one man standing for the truth against an entire world. And for that, he was basically cast out of his bishopric. He was deposed five times and exiled from the country. And then he was brought in. You know, that happened five times because of his stand on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he stood for the truth, even when nobody else was, or at least it looked like nobody else was. And that's what we need to do. So if we can't find anybody else who is encouraging, we need to be that encouraging example to others. We need to try to be that encouraging example. Now again, Barnabas sold his property. He brought the proceeds to the disciples. They distributed it. And he's called the son of encouragement. Ananias sold his property and brought the money. But he didn't give it all. Okay? There was a problem with his particular contribution. And that is he kept back part of it for himself. And Luke tells us his wife was also in on this. Now, this deception of Ananias might have worked except for the fact that the Spirit revealed to Peter what Ananias had done. And so we read in Acts 5, verse 3, he said to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Now, we need to kind of step back and take a look at what, what the problem was here. Okay, well, the problem obviously was deception, but, but what was going on? Now, was the problem that Ananias kept back part of the money and he was really required to give it all? Well, no, because Peter says that they could have kept the property and not sold it at all, continue to own it. He says in verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Okay, this was within your power to sell or not sell. As believers, the Lord allows us to have property. And by the way, I think that's important to see because as we read Acts 5 and what we saw in Acts chapter 2, we might get the impression that if we are to be true believers, we have to sell everything we have, put it in a common pot, and basically have all things in common. But we do need to see that this was a different situation uh, because of all the people who were there that needed to be taken care of, to be discipled before they went home, they were selling and providing for them and for the poor as well, okay? So, yes, we do need to give, but no, it's not wrong to own property. Now, was the problem that having sold it, he had to give it all to the church? Well, not necessarily. Ananias could have given none of it. He could have kept the money for himself. He could have given part of it, or he could have given all of it. You know, whatever he wanted to contribute. Peter says in verse 4 again, after it was sold, was it not under your control? So again, as believers, the Lord allows us to have a savings account, okay? We can save money, we can invest money, there's even a blessing of leaving an inheritance to our children. We don't necessarily have to liquidate everything unless the Lord tells us specifically through providential circumstances and that conviction of the Spirit within that that's what He calls us to do, as He did in the case of the rich young ruler who didn't. Or maybe as he does in the case of missionaries who have to give up quite a bit to go onto the field. Okay, there's nothing wrong with owning property. There's nothing wrong with having money as long as we understand that everything we have belongs to the Lord, belongs to Him. And He can use it however He wants, and we are to use it in a way that gives glory to Him. Now, the real problem with Ananias is this and Sapphira, that they had promised somewhere along the line, had pledged, 
that they were going to give everything that they had from the proceeds of the sale to the Lord. It's certainly what they led everyone to believe. It's certainly what Peter was expecting. Peter said to Ananias, why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, we have to assume from this that, again, somewhere along the line, either before he sold the property or in his bringing the money to Peter, Ananias had indicated he was going to give it all. He had pledged to give the whole amount. And in giving what he gave and not giving the whole amount, he had, in fact, tried to deceive God. He had lied to God. Now, one thing we don't want to miss here is the fact that... that, um, Ananias, in lying to the Holy Spirit, lied to God. Okay, this, this is one of the many passages we have in Scripture that tells us that the Spirit is not only a person who can be lied to. You can't lie to an impersonal force. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. But that He is also a divine person. You know, you've not lied to men, not to Peter, not to the, the apostles. You have lied to God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God who is fully God with all the attributes of God, equal to the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son also is to be worshipped. Now, the question we want to ask is this. What was going on in Ananias' mind? What was going on in his heart that would compel him to do something like this? Why did he promise to give everything from the proceeds of the sale if he was not intending on going through with it? Well, I think from what we see in the passage that he likely did it because others were doing it, right? Others were doing it and it was public and even Barnabas had done this and Barnabas was honored with a new name, you know, because of the encouraging things that he did. And I think Ananias wanted other people to think well of him as well, you know even though we know all was not well with him. Now, I think we need to analyze Ananias here for a minute and see where he went wrong. So let's ask this question. What does the Bible call those who act like they're doing one thing, but who are really doing another or something else, whose hearts are not really in what they're doing? They're only putting on an act. What does the Bible call people who do that? Hypocrites, right. So Ananias was at the very least guilty of hypocrisy, wasn't he? He wanted to be thought well of, but he was really secretly doing something different than what he was saying. And what does the Bible call those people who place such a great value on something, such as money, that they're willing to disobey God in order to have that money, that they want it more than they want God's approval. You know, what does the Bible call people who are greedy and covetous? Idolaters, okay? Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. I think we understand that that idolatry applies to the last part, greed. But really, when you make any of these things, you place any, these are sins, you put anything above God, then you have become an idolater. Remember what the Lord says in, you know, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, which means you shall have nothing in your heart that you place before me in your affections. I will be first and foremost And isn't that why the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength? So they were guilty of hypocrisy and idolatry. And isn't this exactly what Jesus was condemning when he said to to the Laodicean believers in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Do you think Jesus meant those words? Does Jesus ever say things that he doesn't mean? He would rather that we be fully for him or fully against him, but not somewhere in the middle. Now, Jesus tells us that Christianity is is a full commitment. It's all or nothing, okay? All or nothing, not somewhere a blend of both. 
Now, what Ananias did here, we need to realize, too, was worse than what the rich young ruler did. Remember, he was an idolater, too. When Jesus told him that he needed to sell all that he had and give it to the poor, what did he, what did he do? He didn't sell it and then act like he was giving all of it, but then hold back some of it and follow Jesus. He went away sad because he could not do it. He was an idolater who was at least truthful about his idolatry. I mean, he was an honest man. Well, Ananias was not an honest man. So how did the Lord respond to Ananias? Well, he did what he said he would do to the Laodiceans. He spit him out of his mouth. He struck him down. This was an instance of what the Jews called death by the hand of heaven. This was directly done by God. And then Sapphira, because she was also complicit in this crime, received the same penalty. Three hours after they buried Ananias, his wife came. She was likely wondering what happened to Ananias. You know, she was, uh, had, had he been successful in pulling off this deception? And when Peter asked her, you know, when he saw her, he asked her the same question he asked Ananias. And is this true? And she said, yes. And immediately the Lord struck her down as well and took her life. And the young men came and covered her and buried her next to her husband. Now, as we read this, we might be tempted to think this. Well, wait a minute. You know, this is the new covenant. God is a God of love. Jesus is gracious. He loves everyone. He's doing everything he can to try to keep people from going to hell. And yet by striking these unbelievers down, that's exactly where he sent them, straight to hell. Things like this aren't supposed to happen, not in the church, not in the new covenant right? This sounds more like old covenant, doesn't it? I mean, things like that happened quite often back then. At least it seems that way from reading the pages of Scripture. I think the Lord is reminding us here of something that we need to remember, and that is that the Lord does not change. The same God of the old covenant is the God of the new covenant, and Jesus, who came to reveal God to us and explain Him to us, was explaining that God of the old covenant who is the God of the new covenant, who is the only God. God never changes. And because he never changes, we need to realize that he has the right at any time to take the life of any of his creatures. He has that right. We get so used to mercy that we're shocked when the Lord actually administers justice, but God is still the God of justice. He never changes. And, you know, we we see that throughout the New Testament. What does Paul tell us in Romans chapter 1 about those who see the revelation of God in nature, but they suppress that in, in unbelief and they worship the creature rather than the creator? It says the wrath of God is being revealed day by day against those people. And that means people are dying because of that. God is a God of justice, and he can take life whenever he desires to take life. Now, in closing, we should ask ourselves this question. How, how should we respond to, to this account? You know, what does the Lord want us to do with this? Well, I think we need to respond in the way that Luke records the early believers actually responded. Uh, it says more than once, in, in this case, Acts 5.11, and great fear came over the whole church. When Ananias died... They were afraid. When when Sapphira died, they were even more terrified. Uh, And not just the believers, but also the unbelievers. And why were they terrified by this? Is it because they thought God is a God of love who can never possibly do anything like this to me, so I really shouldn't pay attention to this? They must have died of natural causes. I don't think so. I think they were thinking, am I guilty of the same thing? Is God going to do this to me? And they probably got involved into some self-examination. I don't think it's, you know, stretching the imagination to think that that's what they did. They examined themselves. And obviously, if we are wise, we will also examine ourselves with regard to this event. Now, Ananias, let's think about this for a minute. Because have we made promises to the Lord that we haven't kept? Now, let me just start by saying this, because this can get pretty heavy, right? Right? If we truly love the Lord, then God's not going to strike us down unless we get into some real serious sin. We, we understand He does do that sometimes. 
uh, when I was reading 1 Corinthians 11 to introduce the Lord's Supper week by week, every week I was saying, you know, what Paul was saying, because of what you've done, not discerning the Lord's body and dishonoring the Lord and participating in the supper the way that you have, many among you are weak and sick and a number have died. They died because God was disciplining them. I think we have to assume from what we see here with Ananias and Sapphira, some of them died because they didn't even know the Lord. So he was exercising church discipline. He was excommunicating them, even though the Corinthians weren't, okay? God will discipline His children. God will punish the wicked. God is involved in this. But just because we might find some of the same things in our own hearts, we should not assume immediately that we are not converted. But we have to think about it. This is still sin either way that we still need to repent of. So let's think about what Ananias and Fira did. They made a promise to God that they would give the proceeds of the sale of their property to Him to meet the needs of His people, but they broke that promise. That was, again, hypocrisy. Now the question we need to ask from this is, have we ever made promises to the Lord that we have failed to keep? Now, all of us have made promises. Every one of us here who is a member of this church has certainly made promises, and we need to think about, have we kept those promises? Do we still believe the Bible is the Word of God? And are we taking it seriously? Are we turning from our sins and trusting in Jesus alone for salvation? Are we fighting against every sin that we're aware of and against the world, the flesh, and our sinful desires? seeking to put those to death. Those are things we promised God we would do. And then the one that is perhaps the most obvious and, and most concerning is we promised that we would faithfully attend the worship services and serve the Lord. Now, I'm, you're here this morning, so I'm preaching to the choir. The ones that would need to hear this would be the people who aren't here. And again, I have to qualify that, who could be here. You know, it's not, not everybody can be here. People get sick. The COVID situation, we understand that. Okay? But people who could be here, but who choose not to be here, those are the ones that should be concerned, especially if they promised the Lord that they would. Now, we've made promises. If we've raised our children in the church, we've made promises. If we are married, we've made promises. Those are things that the Lord tells us we need to keep. So have we broken those promises? Well, we all have in, in some degree or another. But the difference between the unbeliever and the believer is the believer recognizes that he's done that or she's done that and repents. He turns from that sin and begins to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, secondly, Ananias and Sapphira kept part of the, the money because that money had a hold on them. They were in the same situation as the rich young ruler. Okay? They were idolaters. And again, idolatry is when we love anything more than we love God. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this, do we love anything more than we love God? Is there anything that gets in our way of doing what He calls us to do, what we promised that we would do? Are our hearts divided between Him and the world? Are we lukewarm but not hot for the Lord? Now, again, this reproves every one of us because none of us are as hot as we should be. But this calls us again to repentance. This is a warning given to us, given to, well, the church, right? This, this happened in the church. Ananias and Sapphira were members of the church. They were either converted to Pentecost or, you know, around the lame man or perhaps after that. But they, they changed their mind. They joined the church, and yet they still did this. This happened in the church. They were members of the church. So this is a warning to each one of us that we should not, we must not rest in the fact that we are members of a church because what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing if we don't truly love the Lord. You know, we should not be content to be Christians outwardly, but to be corrupt inwardly. That's the problem of the Pharisee, wasn't it? Jesus says, outside you look like whitewashed sepulchers, and he didn't mean by that you look like tombs. That's what a sepulcher is. But he said sepulcher because of what was inside. Okay, you look outwardly beautiful to men, but inwardly you're full of death and corruption. 
And that's what a hypocrite is, somebody who appears better on the outside than they are on the inside. That's not enough. That's not going to save us. The only thing that will is trusting in Jesus. And the only way we can know that we're trusting in Jesus is if we love him with our whole heart. And we, we know that we love him with our whole heart when we do what he tells us to do. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, we can only do that by the grace of God. And so if we love him in any degree with the kind of love that he says we should have so that we are seeking to do what he calls us to do, then we can know that we belong to him and we should praise and thank him for that. But if we don't, you see, we need to remember that if we really are being hypocritical uh, in the way that Ananias and Sapphira were, that we really don't love the Lord and we're just putting on an act, that, you know, if we really have elevated something above the Lord so that I'm honoring that thing or that person rather than the Lord, rather than doing what He calls me to do, then those are things that indicate that we're not converted if we're not repenting of those things. So if that should be true of anyone here or anyone listening in the future to this video, we need to remember that only God can give us this love. And if He hasn't given it to you, you need to go to Him in prayer. You need to ask for His mercy. Because if you don't receive the mercy of God, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira is one day going to happen to you. You're going to die. And you're going to go down into hell. And there won't be any way that you can be saved. Okay? It has to happen before that happens. Seek the Lord while he may be found. That's what the example of Ananias and Sapphira is teaching us this morning. And it's also something we need to think about as we prepare to come to the Lord's table because we need to repent of, of all our hypocrisy and all of our idolatry and all of our failures to keep the promises we have made to the Lord. We need to repent of those things as we come to the table, otherwise the 1 Corinthians 11 passage reminds us that the Lord may chasten us for our good. So let's self-discipline before we need the Lord's discipline. Well, let's, let's pray and let's ask for the Lord's help.